what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm going to introduce May Lee in a second, formally from Smart Finds Marketing. But before I do, May Lee, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out on the podcast. And there's some, been some interesting ones throughout the years. Um, I suggest checking out the one with Tony Horton, uh, who was one of the founders of P90X. Uh, if you've ever watched P90X, he's got some amazing story about, you know, it's, it's not just the success, Maylee, as you know, you work with a lot of CEOs, founders. It's sometimes the tough times uh, that lead to the success, but we often see on the other end. He actually made money as a street mime uh, when he was in California. And that's how he made his food and rent money before selling, I think, you know, they've sold hundreds of millions of dollars of P90X DVDs and, and other programs, but it wasn't always like that. So check out that, um, you know, and many, many more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, I've been doing this for over a decade and I always tell people, Mainly, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships and profile them and their expertise and their company. And I found no better way to do that than to have them on my podcast over the past over decade. So if you thought about starting a podcast, you know, you should. Uh, if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com, email us. Happy to answer any questions. My business partner and I have been doing this, both of us, for over a decade. So uh, let us know. And I am excited to introduce May Lee. Aztale, and he's the founder of Smart Finds Marketing. Um, and, you know, talking about decades of experience, uh, Maylee, you know, he started his marketing firm in 1987. He helps companies um, on a, a variety of things, but most, like, most recently, they're really focusing in on improving their conversion rate optimization for websites and companies. They use digital marketing, uh, websites, social media, mobile, local listings. They've done it all. Um, and specifically they can help you improve your conversion on your website. And they work from a variety of types of clients from manufacturers to automotive suppliers, to franchisers, to telecom. Uh, and he has been a, an expert, uh, strategic, you know, really relationship to lots of CEOs, CMOs who want to unlock their marketing success. Uh, Maylee, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy, it's great to be on your show. A Don't you big, love the history? <laughs> but yeah, a big shout out to Jerry Nalens of uh, Trade Press Services, who actually introduced us. And she's, uh, you know, check out Trade Press Services. She's also just a remarkable human being I've, have, I've gotten to know over the years as well. It is great. Uh, and uh, she introduced another great guest, Erica um, Miller, who was a Holocaust survivor and tells her story. And she opened a chain of successful uh, clinics after she came to the US. So, um, so Maylee, tell me a little bit more about what was the landscape like in when you started in 1987? And how have things, um, you know, progressed to where they are right now? Yeah, you know, Jeremy, I think just like you're doing now for the last 10 days, to, for the 10 last 10 years, um, you know, you, you find a way to take this knowledge and experience and you figure out how to share it. How, how do you give back, uh, so to speak? Um, and uh, there's no question that the last 35 years have been very interesting. Originally, strictly a, you know, traditional marketing firm. Uh, and then I started the internet group in 94. And that was uh, a lot of, in, that was very interesting. We, we had the wild, wild west of the 1990s. It was great. Um, the, internet, <laughs> the internet was free, so to speak. When I say free, I mean free, free to do anything, right? Um, you got 14.4 modems. You got, um, we had uh, Yahoo, Netscape. I remember a buddy of mine uh, who, where we, you know, who's helped me start up the ISPs division. You know, he, he used to work at Sun Microsystems. We went down to the Sun Microsystems office back in those days. He's showing me Netscape how thrilled he is with the internet. <laughs> so it's like, that was the starting point for the whole thing. 
Um, and, uh, you know, Yahoo, Netscape, um, 14.4 modems, that's where it all started. And then you kind of move on from there, so to speak. Why um, digital they, marketing yeah. or why marketing in general? You know, I know both your, your parents, you're in, you know, you could have been a physician, you know, following their footsteps. I could have. Yeah. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so why marketing? Think, well, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that our, our family is in business to begin with. Our history is in business. And um, I think the other side of the equation is I've always taken uh, a liking to technology. Um, you know, I, you know, I can go back to the ninth, the late 1970s when I was in high school and uh, we had eight and a half inch discs, you know, to run our backups on our mainframe, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, there, there, there was always this affinity to technology. I'm an early adopter, which doesn't, you know, that also plays into this, uh, probably why I ended up starting the, um, the internet group in 94, when I saw the value and the, and the direction that the internet, uh, can bring and how big it can become, uh, it didn't take me long to just adapt and move on, uh, you know, that, I mean, we, we live in a world of change. It's, this is, you know, this is what I like. <laughs> I like change. <laughs> you know, we were talking before you hit it. record here about, I was asking a couple of different industries that we can talk about specifically because you've worked in so many different ones. And I figured we would start um, with um, insurance company and some of the things you did with yeah. them just to, you know, give people some color on what you do. Yeah, you know, um, over all these years, as you can imagine, you know, you gain knowledge and experience um, through a lot of different industries. And I can tell you that as a marketing agency, I don't like the idea that we're niche in one industry. That doesn't make any sense to me because I cannot take on a client in the same industry with, you know, if I already have a client in that industry, that's just a conflict of interest. It doesn't work for me. And it's interesting how so many industries want to work with a marketing agency that only knows their industry. I, I don't know. I, I find that interesting. But um, from my standpoint, I like the broad scope. I like working with businesses in different industries. And I uh, and that certainly plays into what we're going to talk about now. So in Michigan, we had a, um, a business like I, I'm not going to mention their name only because um, they're no longer in business uh, for a lot of other reasons. And um, they uh, launched a new brand uh, back at the time um, that was focused on high um, deductibles. And the project uh, had a $14 million budget. Uh, we were the lead agency to come in and talk about, um, uh, you know, how are we gonna get this off the ground? We had a creative agency that was working with us in terms of its brand. Uh, we had us executing a variety of elements. We actually brought in McCann Erickson for this. Um, and uh, they helped with a lot of the traditional elements because Texas is so large. How do you get reach the audience that you're looking for? And so basically where we're running were at that time, this is back going to 2007, 2008 timeframe, you're dealing with uh, banners, uh, essentially, um, we, you know, running specifically into the Texas market and hyper, hyper targeting areas. Um, and essentially, just to kind of give you some rough numbers going back to those times, uh, we drove 20,000 visitors focused on your 25 to 35 year olds who really don't think they need insurance. Um, and in four weeks, we had a 20% application response rate. Um, and that was pretty um, predominantly on banner advertising, although we did content marketing back in those days as well. Uh, the real impetus came from uh, the banner ad impressions that we were running. Um, and I think for 2007, uh, that was a normal time frame as far as what you're doing and um, uh, the type of strategies that you would employ. Um, and so the insurance industry, you know, this was an interesting one. Uh, the twist wasn't that, hey, let's target anybody who wants insurance. The twist in this case was that it had to deal with the, the 25 to 35 year olds and together with the creative agency, we actually came up with a theme that was focused around um, your music, essentially. The entire theme of the campaign and the brand and um, its branding was around music. And so we used that to target the younger crowd and get the response that we were looking for. Why did they want to target a crowd that just is hard to... Uh... 
hard to read. You know, sure. I, I mean, like, yeah, you know, you're 25, yeah. you're invincible. Do I, I'm fine. Right, you know? exactly. <laughs> um, but if you, I guess if you can do I, that and really get the response from the hardest to reach people, um, that's saying something. I agree. <laughs> right. No, no, no. <laughs> I, look, the, why they wanted to target that age, that age bracket, um, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, they use their own uh, statistics and analytics uh, for the insurance industry to come up with the, you know, what it is that they want to do. Um, and so when they are looking for high deductibles with a low um, insurance premium, uh, this age range made sense. And, you know, you can kind of get the idea. Um, this is the age range where they don't need a lot of, they're not going to be using their insurance much. Give them a low a low premium and a high deductible because they're not going to be using it, but and rather use that money, um, you know, with the way that the insurance companies run their investments. And so I, I kind of get it. I guess <laughs> it you was, know it was the other thing, but we got we made it happen. <laughs> yeah, the other thing I want to point out is you know it, the this is timeless fundamentals, right? So when we were talking about that driving. Um, you know, a banner to a application or something like that. We're talking about human psychology and yep. humans taking an action on something. So exactly. what was the kind of the thought process of the music? If you want to just think back and walk me through, okay, here's how the music linked in. And how did you get, you know, psychology wise, the people who maybe think they're invincible who aren't going to sign up for health insurance to click through and, and take an action that you want? Yeah, so uh, let me clarify one thing. When we when I said music theme, uh, I wasn't referring to uh, actually having music. Uh, although we had some background music on a variety of things that we did, um, we even had uh, green screened two actors, and you know had music with that as well. Um, but the branding theme was focused on, let's say, records, right, and record playing and um, CDs and those types of things, and each category of of insurance had different uh, levels, right? And so we, for each level, we did a different type of music theme uh, that fell into that silo, so to speak, um, and different coloring schemes and different um, uh, graphical uh, visuals. But I think it all, all came down to something you just mentioned. When you, when you talk about marketing, you are talking about people's psychology. Uh, you're talking about color psychology, right? You're talking about, um, uh, visual psychology in terms of what's going to grab their attention, especially when you're dealing with the internet. Um, and uh, irrespective of the technology, sometimes you do have limitations as to what you can or cannot do. Albeit, I think 5G is going to change all that and we'll be, we'll be free to do more. <laughs> um, and uh, when what, human psychology is important, you know, so how do you gra grab their attention and then when you're dealing with advertising, you're talking about running tests, right? Small snippets of tests to see what's working, what's not working. Some cases you're going to switch it all around. In some cases, you're just going to make one little tweak, change the layout, right? You're going to change the colors. You're going to put different graphical elements in one spot and versus another spot. And, um, you know, we're in the United States, so we're, we read left to right. We need to understand that whatever's on the left side and at the top tends to get more attention. These are all things that play into marketing. And a lot of it, um, you know, you can go to school for it all day long at the end of the day, <laughs> um, you know, until you start living it and seeing how it actually plays out in real, in the real world. Uh, this really comes down to uh, experience um, and gaining that experience to figure out, you know, how are you going to make this work? Um, going back to what I said earlier, I think what was important here is um, that while in one case we work with, um, insurance companies, we worked with manufacturing companies, we worked with um, uh, financial uh, institutes, we worked with um, franchisees and franchisors, um, the automotive industry, especially car dealerships. Um, there's been a number of industries. And the interesting thing is being able to take something you gain from one industry, the knowledge and experience you get, you get from one industry, and being able to take that and apply it to another industry, and it does work. Um, so when you're doing, you know, when you've taken that knowledge and experience and applying it someplace else, to be perfectly honest with you, you're making things a little bit more efficient and effective uh, when, you're use, when you're able to use that concept again. Um, and that's where I think this makes, you know, this keeps things make, uh, fun, especially 
when something new comes around and I got to figure out how to use it, how do you apply it? Does it work? Does it not work? <laughs> Keep going. You know, and of speaking of that, going you know, from insurance companies, there's also um, a company you worked with that was couples who have uh, problems conceiving. So talk Correct. about what, what are the things you did in, in that industry? So that particular project, I think the interesting thing about this was it's a brand new, it's a new brand. Nobody knows them. They're, they're, it's, never, it's never been on the market. And while the client had a lot of operational um, uh, issues, fulfilling orders in the beginning is you know, a lot of startup problems, so to speak. Um, our job in a very short period of time, normally I would have loved to add a, a, a quote unquote six month um, planning period on this project, uh, but we had no planning period. We had roughly 30 days or less uh, trying to make it all happen. And there were some um, issues with the client in terms of wanting to get to market quickly. Um, so without a lot of planning that we would like, love to have had, basically we came up with an omni-channel marketing strategy, driving people, primarily social, no question about that, but from different sources, applying content marketing to the mix as well, um, and running some ads. Uh, what was interesting about this, and I'll, I'll mention Statistical first, and then we'll move on to the psychology side of this equation. We drove a little over 800,000 visitors to the website in four months, and that was amazing. The amazing part about this was the fact that when you go back and you analyze that first period, what we learned was that in social media marketing, there is a compounding effect, assuming that you manage you maintain your level of activity. So the number of people did not change on this project. The budget didn't change on this project. The amount of content advertising and shares that we did in social media made no, did not change. But one month to the next, it was exponential about the amount of traffic that we were able to secure during that time frame. And um, I have to admit, the concept of what we did, which was based on a five-point social media marketing strategy, um, using marketers, social media marketers, using brand advocates, and then using social media influencers, I, those are three different levels of people, um, we were able to pull this off. What I didn't expect was the exponential result. Um, I mean, I was doing the, you know, the reason I came up with a strategy originally because um, Google Hummingbird back in 2013 uh, caused me some grief and I lost a large client because of Hummingbird. Uh, the client didn't blame us, but they decided not to play Google's game. And uh, it's a long story, but uh, once that happened, I had to come up with a different strategy that did not include Google, um, both from an organic standpoint as well as from a pay-per-click standpoint. My strategy focused on social media marketing um, because, I mean, go back to the days of your you know, 300 baud modems that we were connecting to bulletin boards. That was social media marketing back in those days, um, you know? <laughs> and so uh, social media marketing is definitely the, the core strategy for most businesses I, I, in, in, in a lot of, I should say in almost all cases. Um, but we came up with this strategy and while we tested it and came up with some ideas of what the results would look like, what shocked me was the fact that uh, we had an exponential result, uh, exponential uh, compounding effect. That was mind-boggling and, and amazing. I want to talk about um, influencers, right? And you mentioned advocates and influencers. Um, and that is a huge effect. And also, they already have their um, their own audiences that they deploy Correct. to that, you know, talk about the... How do you um, approach, what's the best way to approach some of these influencers? Um, and I don't know if there's specific deals for each person or when you um, actually launch it, everyone kind of has the same uh, scenario as far as we're going to pay you or not pay you. Um, just approaching influencers in general, because I think it's a little bit of a black box for some people. Like, it, yes, this sounds like it would work. I'm not sure how do we even go out and approach someone. And what are some of the offers and, and talk about that? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, um, what industry are you in and who's your target audience? Um, if you're in B2B, you're not going to want, you know, 
uh, a B2C influencer and they may have a million followers, that's great, but so what, right? Um, but if you're a B2B, um, you might be talking more towards an influencer who runs his own podcast, like you know, you're know you talking about, and has a following of, let's say, only 100,000 people. But those are the 100,000 people that are quality and are your target audience. So, um, so that's the first question that we have to ask. And then the next scenario is that uh, there's a few different approaches on how do you get to influencers. The first one is the fact that there are agencies nowadays that you can go to. So I'm going to fast forward this to today's world and tell you that uh, um, you can uh, talk to agencies who understand the different types of influencers out there in different markets and make the recommendations of, let's say, five different influencers that you can interview and talk to and so on and so forth. Um, the other one are websites where you can just do your own work. It's basically you figure it out as far as what influencers make sense to your business, the demographics that you're trying to target, uh, your geographies that you're trying to target, et cetera, and figure that out. Um, and of course, the third option is that you may have heard of people and you just approach them directly. I don't know that there's a reason to not go direct to an influencer. Um, I will mention a fourth option, <laughs> kind of a, you know, beating behind, <laughs> beating around the bush, so to speak. Um, and that is that you, you might want to very early on in this process, um, start following an influencer that you really want to have, you know, represent you and just develop the relationship with them directly. Now, what I mean by that is follow what they're doing, comment on what they're saying, you know, what, what they're saying, engage with them, share their content. They need to see that you're, in, you know, you're involved with them. Once they get to see that that repetition's there, whether it's, you know, daily or even a few times a day or weekly, that's when you're going to start to be able to reach out to them and get their, you know, ask for something. Um, it, at that point, it could be free because they're seeing that you're helping them, right? And they're going to say, okay, I'll help you too. And so you kind of, you know, barter your, uh, exchange your uh, services, so to speak, um, or your efforts, uh, labor efforts. Um, but that tends to take longer and is more sweat equity. Um, I think the first three options are better. In other words, um, um, uh, go with the agencies, you know, find somebody or find your, do it, your DIY type websites where you can identify the uh, influences that you want that will form from there. Yeah. Millie, you know, we were talking about conversion and optimization, CRO, and, you know, so I wanted to pull up a few, and we have not looked at this ahead of time. We, we talked a little, I'd love to have you break yeah. down what you're seeing as far as the website goes and, you know, how does this relate to conversions on a website, whatever you want them to do. So I know um, we were talking, you've worked with some telecom companies. So I figured I'd pull up a few okay. and you could just talk <laughs> me through a little bit about what you're seeing, um, you know, what you're seeing is good. And maybe again, all, it's all a test. So we don't know without the data, yep. but what would you test on these pages? So I pull up, if you are listening to this mm -hmm. only, um, there is a YouTube video on this, but we're looking at um, Ring Central uh, website. So I'll just have you walk me through and I'll navigate around where you tell me and what you're seeing. Okay. Real quickly, one thing I'd like you to do is reload the page because I'm curious if we get any pop ups. Um, that this is going to, and, uh, or pop overs, pop ups, whatever you want to call them. Because um, uh, these are areas that you can embed your call to actions. And so when, let, let me just be clear about one thing and let's define something. Conversion rate optimization or what we call CRO um, in the world of marketing, not, not chief revenue officer, <laughs> uh, but rather conversion rate optimization is about taking your existing traffic coming to your website. I'm not talking about spending more money on driving more traffic. Take the existing traffic and figure out how do you increase the number of leads or sales that you're getting from it. Um, the best way to approach this is to figure out what are your calls to actions? What's going to get that person to take it to the next level? That you have to get them to a decision-making stage within one, during their visit or multiple visits and uh, get them to um, uh, reach out to you. So, one thing I will tell you is that in our CRO program, we have an artificial intelligence tool that is tracking the person's journey. And we get reports on that. 
um, that we're able to identify whether the things are working or not working. Um, and we're taking people through various stages. And the AI tool helps based on that visitor's journey, which may not be the one time, but could be multiple times that they're coming to your website, determine what is it that it's going to put in front of them as the call to action. And of course, you set up multiple types of calls to actions that are possible um, during this process you know, ahead, of, ahead of time. And um, that in turn is going to figure out whether or not you're gonna get them to turn, become a, a lead or a sale. The other element of this is running A-B testing. And I don't think that you can get away from that. You, certain pages are gonna react better in one situation versus another situation. You need to know what pages are working and what they're not working. And so I, I'm gonna preface what we're gonna say now about this website um, around these few topics that I just mentioned. Um, and so number one, when you talk about website design in today's world, white space is important. Ring Central has done a great job um, using white space without you know, a lot of um, uh, unnecessary and distracting content. Very simple, you know, they're trying to reach out using people's faces, which I think is important. We did this with a, a car dealership once before where car dealerships tend to take photos, for example, of just the car without a human being. And I think that's wrong. I think they need to have the human being involved in that car or with that car in order to sell it, especially online. Um, but here we have humans uh, interacting with us. I think that's important. Um, but what I'm noticing is we don't have a lot of activity in terms of, um, I mean, we have a chat bot that's okay. Um, and some people like to engage with chat bots, some people don't. Um, we do have a view demo that sticks out on the right. I'm questioning whether or not that needs to be on the left in the, in the middle. This is where I would run an A-B test. Uh, the view demo on the top left is, you know, catches my attention, but the view demo on the lower left does not. Um, I would suggest running an A-B test and seeing which one of these based on location and background makes sense. Does C pricing make sense over there or does, do you want to do the demo first and then go to pricing? And this is where Google Analytics comes into play. You figure out what the flow is of the, of the people that are, um, uh, that are coming to your website and whether or not you know, the location, color schemes, et cetera, make a difference um, based on where people are at. So um, I, you know, off, off the top of my head, that would be the first thing that catches my attention. How do we take that view demo and see pricing? Because those are your primary calls to action and figure out whether or not they're sitting in the right locations. Got it. Yeah. And as we scroll down, I don't know if there's any other, you know, looks like they have some elements here. Um, are there anything yeah. else you would think of testing? Uh, you mentioned like uh, movement. Um, I don't know if you are referring to like some kind of video here as opposed to they have a static image. I don't know yeah, if there's anything I, else you would I test. Agree. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, people do like video uh, and we've seen a growing number of people moving towards video, right? I mean, so Instagram's um, uh, section where they have, you know, the videos or YouTube. These are good examples of where YouTube uh, video is a primary player in trying to get people's att uh, um, attention. Um, you know, looking at the rest of the website, I, I think everything about their homepage is about that top section. And I would just play around with some new ideas in terms of that demo, that pricing, and whether or not there should be a video there or not. Yeah. And we'll go to the next one, but I'll just uh, quickly click sure. on the, uh, just to see what does it show uh, when we have yeah. the pricing <laughs> and the um, and the demo. So we can see that the pricing page is kind of like a standard pricing page yeah. comparing plans and the um here's the demo um uh, right. page here i don't know if there's any comments on that yeah the, the only comment i have is not the demo this demo page but the pricing page is too complicated mm. I'm, I'm a i'm a i'm a consumer i don't know the difference between ring central mvp up at the top versus the ring central video right um mm. and down below i have a whole flurry of lists of services and some of it makes sense, right? 
you, you might be able to figure it out. And some of it might be like, well, do I really need it? Um, it's like the list is, it's like they put too much information at this point um, in front of people. Yeah. I have to really sift through and, and now I'm spending time trying to figure out out of these four yeah. plans, which one's the best. Right. And, and they're not, you know, we're talking like $7 of, difference, I know, <laughs> right. So just right. give me something to start with. Maybe you're saying, and don't, don't give me everything. Correct. You know, so they one th they did two things over here is, you know, and I understand what they try to accomplish. They put most popular on the left and put that in, in that orange color to get people's attention. And they put best value over there on the right. But the best value it doesn't stick out because that's not really a strong that that um, maybe that uh, light blue just doesn't grab people's attention right away. Um, and then, of course, like I said, we have these tabs up at, the, at the top and I'm not sure whether or not I should. Check yeah. into them too. I or not, honestly, right? so, anyway. until you pointed that out, really, I didn't even realize that was there. So I didn't even see those tabs. I just saw, I was just scrolling right. down. So I had my eye didn't you wouldn't even have known, catch right? these <laughs> things. Yeah. <laughs> until you pointed that out. So I agree. I agree. Yeah, so anyway, so, that, that would be, yeah. I, I'm not saying it's wrong, right? But I would definitely suggest doing an A B test on this and just bring down the distraction um, and focus on, you know, something that's going to take people right into without a lot of thought process to become a client. Then you can upsell them if you wish later, but you're trying to upsell them up front when they don't know what it is that they want to buy. And I, I just bring it back. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. So the next one I pulled up here is uh, grasshopper.com, uh, which uh -huh. I guess does something similar um so walk me through yep. your and they here. got it so they have a chat bot as well um what i'm seeing over here and look uh we did a lot of work on um color psychology we've done it a few times uh on a few projects and um i'm a little concerned about the color scheme over here um there's something not quite right uh that it's like I the colors are distracting to me. Um, and number two is we have a distracting top of before, above the fold page. I've got the colors and then I've got those lines all coming in from the left and the right. Um, all these things are distracting me before I can even read, keep personal and business call separate. Um, I, I suggest keeping it simple. Apply kiss, right? <laughs> that would be I, that's yeah. the first thing that calls comes to my mind. And there are no real calls to actions here because of the distraction. The distractions are taking people away from the the core element that you want, which is to get them to sign up. Um, up to seventy five dollars off of what, right? So because there's, I mean, it I it doesn't jump out to me that I can click somewhere in there um get started for free well yeah but and it says you know it takes me a little while but then i realize there's 26 dollars a month there um i just think this is a clear a, a to b test method come up with a completely b version that's so far away from this that reduces the distractions and see if that does any better yeah yeah, and you could see in the ring central, you really kind of have two color schemes. Uh, you have orange it's, and blue and white. Here, if you're looking at what we're looking at, you see a try free at the top, which is blue button. And then you have a purple button that's get started free. Yeah. And then there's different colors like purple and blue coming in. Um, and the black at the top sticks out, right? Mm -hmm. It's so, a whole nother. Color You're saying, here. babe, is basically test just maybe the try free at the top is just purple, so it's consistent with the try free in the middle or whatever. Yeah. Just the the color scheme. There's a couple different colors going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you you pick these two because Ring Central is easy on the eyes. I can focus on the content without the distractions, right? Yeah. The and. The only A-B test that I think that they may want to try is just this view demo and pricing. The other thing that we found in their case is that their pricing page is a little busy. I think they could 
narrow that down and focus on something just to get people started. Um, but grasshopper is wildly distracting. Yeah. And I'll just click through. Back off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always obviously um, maybe this is working from them and it's doing amazing and maybe not, but uh, it's just a test. Uh, yeah. And then so here's the if you click on the get started free button, here's what we see as far as this goes. Obviously, this is much. It seems like much um, easier. easier. Yes. Yep. Um, scroll down a little ways, though. Let's see what we got here. Choose, choose a toll free number. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's this is what we're talking about for the homepage, right? Keep it easy on the eyes. Keep the distractions to a minimum. Um, and you just said something I think is important to mention. And we've come across this. I mean, at least I, I've come across this many times, especially with other CEOs. They'll tell me, oh, we're doing great, right? So they're saying that, okay, look, we, you know, we're getting 20% or whatever the response rate is on the website. And then... They're saying, well, we don't think we need to change this. I said, well, what if that 20% was 30%? What would you do then? <laughs> right? So how well they're performing is really dependent upon whether or not they're running through the various testing methods to figure out whether or not their base that they have right now that they're comfortable with, that they seem to think is a success, is really a success. Maybe you can bump it up 5%. Um, and, but that requires somebody to sit down and do the analysis and interpret the information, come up with a new idea, and then run that A-B testing as well as other calls to actions that you know you can find out whether or not you can bump it up by five or 10 more percent. Yeah, yeah. it's worth a test. And like you could see the ring yeah. central buttons are blue. Um, and then mm -hmm. the grasshopper buttons are kind of all over the place as far as what they're, you know, it's blue on the homepage and it's purple yeah. in the middle. And then when you click through to the get free, it's green. And so yep. um, the green definitely sticks out. So that just makes me think, well, and maybe they didn't yep. choose green because it blends in too much with the rest of their site. I don't know. But um, it's interesting that they have three. No, you know, yeah, go ahead. You know what the, you know what the homepage reminds me of is, is if you go to Adobe's um, color, color wheel, mm. the color schemes that they provide you and they give you some ideas. This is what this reminds me of. Somebody pick, you know, a starting color. And then from there, they used a, um, a color scheme wheel of some sort that gave them, okay, these are the other colors that you can try and use with this color. And they basically applied them all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'd back off on that. I really would. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, um, I just want to say, you know, Maley, this has been fantastic. I love kind of hearing and uh, following your, your marketing brain at work. Um, as far as that goes. And um, I just want to point people towards where they can find out more, learn more. Um, they can go to smartfindsmarketing.com to learn more. Are there any other places online uh, that we should point people towards? I would suggest reaching out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I am a big LinkedIn fan. I've been with, on LinkedIn for since 2005. Um, I have 16,000 really close friends <laughs> on LinkedIn. Um, but by all means, I, I would say reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's the best place to find me. Awesome. Um, and uh, obviously, our website is full of information, uh, full of knowledge, a lot of experience uh, in terms of its content and its different sections. We are coming out with a new website, hopefully uh, within this first quarter. Uh, it also will uh, show a new brand and new colors for us. Uh, we've um, basically decided to uh, kind of get freshen things up, so to speak. Awesome. Everyone check out smartfindsmarketing.com. Check out Maylee on LinkedIn. Check out more episodes on Smart Insider and Rise 25. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. It was great being on your show. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.